Welcome to Censored, and this is the last episode of Season 9. It's actually my last episode on Dirty Books for a while, but keep an eye out for next season. There's a new look, a new sound, and new filth from Dirty Films. I know that so far, Season 9 has been all about memoirs, but to finish, I thought I'd try something more light-hearted. Michael Arlen was a best-selling author in the 1920s, but it's fair to say that his work has been almost completely forgotten. I have read his massively popular The Green Hat from 1924, but for me, it was bewildering. I just didn't get it. It's possible his work was very much of the moment, maybe capturing something about his time that in the end proved ephemeral. Like many overnight successes, Arlen struggled to please his audience in the same way ever again. He kept writing, but nothing landed quite like the green hat. His next biggest success was about ten years later. Hell, said the Duchess, was published in 1934. If you want to stick a genre label on it, it's a murder mystery with a touch of supernatural thriller. There's a saintly woman victim, Mary, the Duchess of Dove, whose name is about as subtle as a brick, and very obvious names is one of the things Ireland likes to do in this novel. Then there's a fiendish villain, Xanthus Axelo, but more on them later because there's a lot to say. But really, most of the story is narrated through the cops from Scotland Yard, who are accompanied by an amateur detective. Victor Wingless, the amateur, is also conveniently a cousin of the sainted victim Mary. So he's a member of the elite, he's kind of aristocratic, as is one of as is one of the Scotland Yard blokes, but the other two, they're more socially and ethnically ambiguous. But I'm getting ahead of myself now. All of this should be discussed properly with my guest, Dr. Laura Ludkey. Laura is a co-host on Lit Sci Pod, and I've actually had her on the pod here before. She joined me previously to discuss Stella Gibbons' novel. Have a look in the show notes for a link to that episode if you did miss it. Hi, Laura. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be discussing this novel with you. This has been a bit of a wild read, I will admit. (laughs) Before we get started on how wild it is, shall we choose a drink? There wasn't a lot of drink really in it, but at the very end, near the denouement, when it's all getting really crisis laden, one of the main characters has a whiskey and soda to buck him up. And I thought that would help. (laughs) What about you? Well, I don't think I would like the tea being offered at the alarming sort of pastorally perfect cottage outside Leatherhead. So I'll be having the gin and bitters, uh, the drink that turns you know, the hero of the novel, we might, we might say, um, it, from Victor Wingless to Victor Legless. <laughs> and I'm not sure why he doesn't have his with a tonic, um, but that would account for his, the swiftness of his inebriation. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, bitters is only a splash, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And they're just supposed to be having a cheeky pint while they discuss the case. Um, He's like, I think I'll have a few gin and bitters. Yeah, not many TV detectives have a gin and bitters, do they, when they retire to the pub to discuss the case? (laughs) (laughs) Not anymore. It's fallen out of fashion. Absolutely. So when I started to read it, I mean, honestly, I don't know why I chose it. It just appealed to me and I thought, give it a go. And of course, we have both read a previous Michael Ireland book. Um, So I thought it's worth a shot. Can't be that bad. And initially I thought, I don't know why this is banned. It seems fine. In fact, I think the average Irish censor of the 1930s would have found it quite amusing. They would have cheered on the mockery of British politics. They probably giggled at parts of it because it has, it is humorous and it has a knowing tone to it. And one of the parts that I suppose I found most amusing In chapter three, it talks about British politics, who's running the government. And this is all fictional, of course. It feels very fictional now, 
but perhaps less so in 1934. Um, and Oswald Mosley is the senior powerful politician um, and he's in power in this fictional universe that Arlen has created. And Arlen writes, there are very many sound and far from silent Englishmen who believed heart and soul in the principles of fascism, which are, of course, to take a strong stand and damn well keep it. <laughs> I just thought Arlen, first of all, would have been great in social media. He was a loss to the media age. And this isn't the only time that he really goes in hard on ideas of Britishness or perhaps more precisely Englishness. And there was something about that catty, bitchy tone I think would have been popular with the censors. And he does go in hard about games as well, doesn't he? He's merciless on the role of sport in creating Englishmen. How did you find all this sark that he directs against elites in the English establishment? I enjoyed it naturally and found it refreshing the way that Arlen satirizes, say, the deference certain high ranking police officers like Commissioner Major General Sir Giles Prest Olive and his assistant commissioner, the Honorable Basil Iceland, uh, give to their noble peers, much to the chagrin of those who've worked their way up, like Superintendent Crust. And this is just a, a nod, I think, to Conrad's a secret agent where maybe there are similar politics at work. Um, I found that Prest Olive and Iceland are frequent foils to one another in a way that they represent the elite. So, you know, we have Pres Prest Olive, um, it's not P-R-E-S-S-E-D, it's P-R-E-S-T, Olive, um, married into the esteemed Le uh, Leicestershire Fox Vermin family, um, Fox with two F Fs, of course. Um, well, Iceland was also an Irishman who, had he not been so very good at games, the narrator tells us, he might sometimes have been suspected of sarcasm. I mean... Even as it was, the narrator teases us, some thought that his views on cricket and war were unsound. And I wondered what you made of the unsoundness of his views on cricket and war being Irish. Yes, it was interesting the way that he was brought in. First of all, it describes Prest Olive and his beautiful aristocratic nose, which even if no matter what direction you were looking at him from, the nose was the most prominent feature because you have to have a great nose and be handsome in an aristocratic way to get ahead. And so then he introduces Iceland and says, you know, he's great at games. And he says he looks different to Prest Olive. But of course he does, because he's Irish. Right. But, but he doesn't look visibly Irish. This is no. the key thing, I think. No, he doesn't look visibly Irish. He's described as dark and sallow and in many ways, I suppose, of a par with later characters who are seen as foreign, as in not Irish or English. Um, and the way that he is set up as, as like in this double act with Pressed Olive, where you've got the very aristocratic and complacent English elite, and then someone who's come through the same system, but who is an outsider in some way, who isn't married to the aristocracy and who is a part but at the same time, you wonder, I mean, the only way he got to go and play those games is if he comes from aristocracy in Ireland. So he can't be that far out the side of the system, yet he is set up as so far. Um, and it was fascinating to see them work together and against each other, or most of the time with each other, really. I do get the impression that the Irishman Basil Iceland is the brains of the operation. When it's not crust. Who is definitely not the upper crust, we'll say. No, he's not the upper crust. He has broken through the glass ceiling slash crust of society. <laughs> well, and it definitely um, suggests to me that being a good sportsman is enough to make people not pay attention too closely to your un undesirable political views or being from a less desirable class or nationality. So if you're good enough at cricket or polo or something else, you will get on in the world that Arlen is satirizing. Yeah, it can erase all of the problematic aspects of your opinions or upbringing and therefore transform you into this English elite person. It was never a surprise to me that the, the novel's plot hinges on the fact that the aristocracy is in decline in some sense. There's some degeneracy possibly. 
and that English identity is in peril when the stability and maybe status of the aristocracy is under threat. But I have to admit, the introduction of Mosley as the Minister of War and a fascist conservative coalition government led by Winston Churchill did throw me for a bit. And I mean, I knew that Mosley had been an MP at least twice and that there had never been a fascist conservative coalition government. But I did have to remind myself that Mosley, six baronet Mosley, had only been the chancellor of the Duchy of Lan Lancaster in the Labour government. Well, I I actually went to check his bio because I was so I was like, this didn't actually happen, did it? Just I'll just double check because I have no memory for these things. If this is real, maybe the rest of the novel's events could be too. But this just really goes to say how the late 1920s and early 30s was such a quagmire of a time in Britain. Absolutely. And actually, if all of the rest of it was real, I mean, it it got a bit crackers. Because while I was thinking, I don't know why they would object to this. This seems fine. Uh, they'd like the heroine. She seems like a nice person. She's pure of spirit and heart and doesn't go out meeting anybody. So she can't be doing anything sexually wrong. And it's chapter five when he brings in a murder plot. And I think this this had to be why the novel was banned. When they got to this part, they were like, that's it. Because the murders are characterized by sexual sadism. It's a gender flipped version of Jack the Ripper, actually. And I was they even call them Jane the Ripper <laughs> killings. <laughs> like, Arlen, really? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> And it was really odd because, of course, there's so much talk about Jack the Ripper killings and the celebrity culture around them and the misogyny and all of that, which I'm very familiar with. But to read it in a gender flipped way made it seem so much more uncomfortable and raw and unfamiliar and just upsetting. I mean, how did you react to this mad moment? Oh, I found the twist absolutely thrilling. Um, I hadn't finished reading the novel yet uh, when I encountered some online chatter about the novel's wild ride of a plot, so to speak. And perhaps I was reading extra attentively, trying to discern when, the when at which point the w ride became wild and then it became more wild. Um, and spoiler alert, it was the wildness was there all along. So while trying to anticipate what the confidential agent, Mr. Henry James Fancy's lifelong passion for putting two and two together would add up to, um, as soon as we have the other mutil mutilations of a fanciful nature, which will serve no purpose to describe were mentioned, and then the special type of short, narrow surgical knife commonly sold only to members of the surgical profession was introduced, I exclaimed aloud, and rather ecstatically in a public place. Are we looking for a Jane the Ripper? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, these are the terms that Arlen uses himself exactly like a page, a page or two later. So I'm not that far ahead. Um, but he's really, he's really careful throughout the novel to draw our attention to the ways in which there is increasing equality for women and men making possible, if not uh, possible, the suspicion that the criminal is indeed a woman. Yes, that's yeah. a good point. It, he really does play a lot with gender as well through this murder plot, not only by creating an omnivorous, dangerous sexual predator who's a woman instead of a man. And then, of course, he introduces the villain figure who... Well, before we before we get to even who the villain is, if I, if I may, because I do, that, I think that's probably the most interesting part of the novel. I got waylaid um, thinking by, by different plot opportunities that Arlen opens up. So I thought that perhaps Jane, in quotation marks, was picking off members of the British fascist party because she, in quotation marks, was um, not um, a, a, a fascist herself. Um, she might have been a, a communist sympathizer, possibly, who knows, or that Mrs. Nottingale, um Naughty Gill. You can see that the accent is really, really not conveying what Ma Maggie Smith can do with the word Gill. Um, a, a noted fascist sympathizer with a signed portrait of Mussolini. Maybe she was somehow orchestrating some sort of anti communist stitch up to blame them for framing the Duchess for these crimes. And all of these possible narrative avenues are left explored 
so many threads left untethered. And I just wondered what you made of the attempt to pinpoint the class, the nationality of a murder using clues such as a very particular scent, a very particular cigarette and a very particular lipstick. Yeah, I mean, initially, when that's all they have to go on are just these traces of this woman. And they just refuse to believe that she could be English just based on these evidential clues. So the cigarette, they think, well, you know, she can't be English. And so they think, oh, she must be German or Japanese because we don't get on with them right now, which seems <laughs> seems like something people would have noticed as, <laughs> as a witness uh, statement that you would have noticed the person in question was not English. But they're like, no, she can't be English. And this, yeah, this denial that such violence and sexual sadism could exist inside a woman who is English and could be enacted like that. Um, and, and it had to be an attractive English woman. That was the most important, important part. She had to be a hot number. Oh, yes. She is extremely hot. I mean, she's the sort of woman that everybody remembers because she's so damn hot and is also having a great time when she's out and about, um, is very conspicuous in her pleasure and her enjoyment. And so she definitely is extremely memorable. And you'd think, well, they would have noticed if she was Japanese or German as well. But no. The perfume and the cigarette that all must in somehow imply that she is foreign. Too distracted by her, her hotness to notice, you know, ethnicity or race or anything else. <laughs> and there is another uh, foreign figure then that sort of the villain, the villain has many disguises. And the first disguise is of an of a man that is foreign that is somehow like they're like is he spanish he's once again a dark and swarthy thin man in many ways he sounds the way that isolin has been portrayed there seems to be a mirroring um so there is a lot of concern in the narrative with where people are from where they might be from what they might look like and what that might tell us and arlen himself was armenian wasn't he yeah, yeah. And I, I think sort of that that gives him a sense of needing to know where everybody is in hierarchies. And possibly that was also of interest to his readers because he does it in a lot of his other work. Yes, yeah. And the villain, I mean, we have to... to... Yeah, can we just have a whole episode on the villain, please? I know. <laughs> <laughs> As it went on, it was like, wow, this is... <laughs> Uh, first of all, his name, Xanthus Axolo, which recalls the axolotl, those little amphibians with the smiley faces. Really I couldn't cute. unthink it, actually. I thought that, and then I then I read your you, that you thought that as well, and I went, what? <laughs> I know. I couldn't believe it. I was like, but he's a villain. How can you bring this image to my mind? <laughs> and then, of course, as I said, he's in some guise as a foreigner with this dark skin, and then he has a criminal past, which sort of emerges very slowly. And he's been in jail and people are scared of him in jail and his malevolence is commented upon. And then you think, yeah, OK, this is fair enough. And it is creepy. But really, I mean, Arlen just turns up the horror. So by the very end, um, it's this extraordinary. I don't think we, we can really explain it because it's so extraordinary. I don't know how to say it. What the hell did you think was going on? <laughs> um, so um, to use the narrator's own terms, there is something damn queer about the case. It is inexplicably queer, also yes. to use words from the novel, such that the solution would not be found through ordinary police methods, also to use the narrator's terms. And really boldly, I would like to propose that so the solution that the, the detectives and indeed the reader is looking for is that we should listen to the Duchess. Oh, tell me, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, so she herself mentions that she has a twin and this is never investigated or followed up in any way. And she insists that there is someone or something in this world who has my body and my face and my eyes and my voice. And, and I thought, oh, a twin narrative, this will be interesting. And of course there is no twin narrative because at this point we don't know about the villain. Um, and she's at the point of entertaining suicidal ideations that are swiftly dismissed by her companion, Miss Amy, Amy Ghoul. Um, 
I know another awful Arlen name. And the Duchess thinks that she's going mad, certain that she has, quote, a twin sister who is so much more seductive to men than she can ever hope to be, that they will let her take them home and murder them. And this isn't maybe the, the same, exact same thing that actually is happening, but she's telling us that something unnatural or supernatural is afoot in the novel. But this, can, we, can we reveal the shape-shifting nature of the villain? Oh, go on. I suppose, yes. I think we, ha- I think we have to. So th- there's a, the threat of the shape shifting, hard to pin down precisely what the villain is, as well as the threat of the other um, aspects of the novel that remind me of Richard Marsh's 1897 novel, The Beetle. Is this something oh. that you've heard of? No, I haven't read that. No. Which is funny. Uh, so it's uh, it sold more copies until about the 1920s uh, than Bram Stoker's Dracula, which came out in the same year. And it plays on many of the same tropes. And one of the reasons why it was a bestseller was because it combined elements from police and detective fiction, as well as sensation fiction, urban gothic, and science fiction, all into you won't believe what happened next narrative package. Um, And so in this book, the titular Beetle is a gender-bending, shape-shifting magician from Egypt who is sent to take revenge on a prominent English politician for his youthful indiscretions with the cult of Isis, whilst on the Victorian equivalent of a gap year. This sounds mental. <laughs> I mean, it, it is, it is, but in the same way that Arlen's novel is. And so the Beatles' mesmeric powers are sexualized, especially when one of the novel's characters um, is, is being crawled on by the Beatle. It's very sexualized. It's a very Ooh. large Beatle, but also it might be a woman. And it's difficult to discern at various moments due to poor lighting, whether the figure is a man or a woman. And then there's this sexy bite, but sort of climactic duel between the beetle as mesmerist and this scientist in his private underground laboratory who has this electricity generating machine. So there's bizarre, unexpected, um, unfathomable moments like that, um, that, that that have some commonalities. And as in Hell said the Duchess, at the end of the beetle, the shape-shifting figure evades capture or indeed execution and leaves behind only a pile of clothing plus some moral sexual confusion. I see. Yeah. So, I mean, Arlen, in his effort to, you know, write new things, because that's what he was trying to do after the green hat was write something good that was different to the green hat. You don't think he managed? Well, I think that what it has in common with the Beatle is this merging of different genres and narrative expectations together. Um, and I know I, I did have a look at early reviews of the novel because you know this is my thing to do. Uh, I want to know what the readers thought. And so in The Spectator, William Plomer sort of describes Axelo as this supernatural being, but also a vampire hermaphrodite and erotomaniac with a cozy pated tarot leatherhead. Um, but this review notes that Arlen's latest novel is as facetious as its title. Find, and it, this review finds that he's perhaps less at home with the mysteries of iniquity than when he's waggishly familiarizing us with the private lives of his rich entitled characters. Oh, that's a bit harsh. Basically saying, stick with what you know, Arlen, don't do new things. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's very fair because there's more in it than that. And there's a lot of political narrative in it too. Well, so this is this is this is what br- brings me to a question that I had for you is what did you find more disturbing? The sort of incestuous moments between Victor Wingless and the pseudo duchess or the masses invading Gravener Square raiding the duchess's underwear drawer and parading about with her silk French knickers worn as fancy headgear in the streets? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly say that at the end, Wingless, when he meets the villain slash villainess, um, and there is this sexually charged moment, that was really, truly quite creepy. <laughs> it was on a kind of the level of horror. It was good. Um, but I think that all of the the political narrative, I think, was really well done throughout. Um because there is the sense that the the, the two upper crust uh, detectives are constantly worried about public opinion and what they will think about the management of this murder case. Because about what they'll believe, what they, what they, they don't believe the facts that are before them anymore. Yes, that they won't accept that it 
isn't a woman from the aristocracy, that they are convinced it is and that they won't change their mind no matter what the police say. And I think that gap in trust between the elites and the people that they govern is really interesting. And that moment when they riot, when they attack her house because she is believed to be the murderess who's been covered up for by the police. It's not just that she's the murderess, it's that, you know, it's not being investigated. That is, I mean, I thought that was really powerful, actually. It, it is. And this seems to be in parallel to the street battles between fascists and communists. And the narrator is really keen to point out that the communists have learned the internationale in sort of with an accent, i.e. there are foreign agitators at work here. So we have the fascists as being homegrown. Um, mm. The communists are some sort of outside terrible influence. Again, great threat to the aristocracy in England that must be suppressed. And if the boys can't, from Eton can't do it, who can? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I think Ireland sometimes forgets whose side he's supposed to be on narratively. <laughs> it's like Every one side. Woman. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, he just likes to take pot shots at everybody. Um, but I think yeah, when they sack her house, I mean, they would have lynched her had they found her. Well, they specifically minch, they specifically mention lynch law, yes. um, which is the right to execute somebody without due process. I mean, yes. sorry, right to. I mean, it's obviously not a right, um, <laughs> but it is. It is. Um, it, uh, what, would, what would we call it? Something that has been exerted. Um, particularly during the American Civil War. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, that fun time. <laughs> that was sarcasm. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be clear. Just, just because you're good at games doesn't mean you can get away with that sort of thing. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not good at games. <laughs> That's all right, then. You can be sarcastic. <laughs> so did, did you... Politics and humor often intersected in the novel in really interesting ways. Did you find that there was something humorous in the interchange between Superintendent Cross, Colonel Wingless, and um, Assistant Commissioner Iceland about the offenses for which Axlow was not only struck off the medical register, but was com committed to hard labor? Oh, yes. Do, do, you, should I, should, do you want to read this out or shall I? Okay. Yeah, I'll read it out. So, yes, they're talking about Axlow because they know that he's been put in prison. And uh, they're trying to talk about what he actually did on the charge seat. And uh, one of them says, sir, I would not sully your ears. You do an injustice to the colonel's club, said Iceland. His ears have been sullied by experts. Boom, boom. The man, said Crust indignantly, was a sapphist and a nymphomaniac. <laughs> Must be an acrobat, said Wingless. He means, said Iceland, sadist and erotomaniac. <laughs> And so there's some interesting translations going on there that indeed a sadist is the same as a sapphist and, and a nymphomaniac is the same as an erotomaniac. There is just a gender flip going on there. Um, but Yes, and I think it is, a, it is also poking fun at the lower class policeman who doesn't know the big complicated words well enough. So there is that. I mean, I, a lot of people would read that just simply as crust is an idiot. Um, that he's a foil to these these men. Um, but then before it, you have that dig about the clubs of which the colonel is a member, which would only be the most elite ones and the implication that they are, in fact, full of filth. <laughs> I did have to um, make some notes on which ties, um, which tie pins he wore because they they were indicative of some sort of elite rugby club or something like that um so so there's, there's moments throughout that where we're constantly being reminded about this yeah and in the introduction to my ebook uh the person who wrote that mentioned that Ireland was very conscious about um dressing extremely well even when he had no money he always wore beautifully tailored clothes and he was oh, a bit of a T.S. Eliot yes he was very conscious of trying to appear a certain way. And I suppose being a foreigner um, from a part of the world where, you know, people wouldn't really have a lot of experience of them. Um, I think he felt that he had to appear as a gentleman very much. So I think his, his interest in clothes is personal as well as political. 
So shall we try the uh, censorship bingo? Yes, and I have prepared for this um, somewhat. So, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I may have had fun uh, preparing. I mean, I think it's going to score pretty high. Okay. Right. So we'll start with breasts. Yes, definitely. Yes. Um, can, can I give you some examples of breasts? Because these are these are breasts. Um, Miss, Mr. A. Candle knows the young man of Jewish persuasion, who is the only victim to survive Jane the Ripper's attacks, recalls being attacked by a, a tall, skinny sort of woman with firm, girlish breasts. Later, Colonel Wingless traces his, with his eyes the lines of, I'm going to call her Pseudo Mary's round breasts, and of her slender feminine body beneath the gown that she's wearing. And moments later, when her body yields to him with a soft submissiveness, that seemed to seem to burn her tight round breasts into his chest. These are dangerous and memorable. <laughs> yes, they they are powerful powerful memories. Um, but it, it this is I mean this is ironic to me because she's held the, the Duchess in society is held in esteem for having legs that are almost as good as an American chorus girl's. Not that you will ever have seen them, and teeth which were white as boiled rice, but much nicer to look at. So she's not known for her breasts. <laughs> Yeah, but boiled rice teeth, that's just unforgettable. <laughs> Who writes that? Arlen was quite mental. Ar Arlen, Arlen writes that. <laughs> Arlen, yes. Uh, so yes, we're ticking breasts, like by three. And then bestiality. Well, yes, because the shapeshifter is like a snake. Yeah, we're, we're taking this one. This is a win. We're taking this one because I never get to tick bestiality. So, you know, <laughs> we have to tick this. Just because the smallest amount counts. Yeah. Well, Colonel Wingness is practically shagging a snake, so we can tick that. And then sex work. So I think there's some oblique references, um, at least to the idea of sex work, if not actual sex work taking place. Uh, so we have the city's meaner night resorts where male guests were decidedly of questionable character and the ladies un-English in their manner of earning a living. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and we also have some explicit comparisons later. So the narrator describes Pseudo Mary's body as being greedy like a whore mm. um, during her encounter with Wingless. Yes. And of course, even bringing up a Jack the Ripper comparison inevitably means everybody thinks sex workers. I forgot to look for the obvious. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Ooh, three out of three so far. Uh, racism. Well, yeah. Anti-Japanese sentiment. I think that counts. Ah, and don't forget the anti-Semitism. Yeah. Double racism. <laughs> Double racism. And then all the suspicious of dark swarthy types. Um, who could be from anywhere, but who are certainly not English because they don't have the right nose. So, yes, well, we're taking that one, too. This is great. Uh, drugs. So I'm going to say yes, possibly. Okay. So Wingless won't accept tea from Pseudo Mary because he's worried it's going to be poisoned, but then accepts the stimulant avidly, by which he means the whisk whiskey and soda. So he's calling he it's being described as a stimulant. Also, Axelo has a laboratory upstairs. Yes. And he desperately wants us. He, they want us to see it. Yeah. And I think that there's a suspicion that a lab must have things on cooking under Bunsen burners. So, yeah, I think we could take that too. Hmm. Politics. Politics oh, yeah. galore. <laughs> For sure. Um. Yeah, not only fascism and communism, there is a fascist conservative coalition government, but possible allusions to Irish pacifism during the Great War. Um, depressed Olive's appointment is a political one. And there is a nebulous spirit of unrest abroad in England at the time. Yes. Yeah, it's a deeply political novel. I'd love to know how it felt to read it in the midst of the 30s when the fascists... I mean, they're not a busted flush quite yet, but they're certainly lost some of the edge. But it's only a few years since they were a very serious concern for the establishment. So, yeah, it's it's a very topical novel, really, isn't it? Especially if it's imagining a, 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 an alternative future in which Mosley and Churchill are on the same side. 
imagine. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> We've got nothing in common. <laughs> Is that sarcasm again? No, I'm terrible at games. I'm not capable of sarcasm. <laughs> right. Well, we can tick politics. Swearing. It's it's a sweary book, but the swear words are pretty milk toast. Mm. I mean, there's a swear word on every page. What swear word do you mean? In the title, if the, in in my first edition that I was reading online, the title's printed on the top of every page. So there's a hell on every page, sometimes two. And she, she doesn't ever say hell, does she? Um, she never says hell. Yeah, but we have we have bitch used as a swear word. Oh yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, and five instances of damned and another five of damn. Okay, well, yeah, definitely earning the tick here. Um, and then infidelity. Ooh, no. what do you think is going on with Mrs. Nottingale? Oh, yes, she does seem a bit dodgy, doesn't she? On every level. Well, the narrator, the narrator explains that she reversed the usual procedure in that her friendships began in bed and continued to the dinner table. So if she remains married, is not a widower, then the yes, there's infidelity. Yes, yes, definitely. Let's take that one. And then crime. Well, I mean, yeah, the whole thing. It's a crime story. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I've counted four types of crime. <laughs> um, murder. Or as a friend would really like me to say, because this is um, when we play the Sherlock Holmes board game, we have to say it in this voice, moider. Moider. Because it brings down the house. Um, there's been a moider. Um, impersonation. I think that's what's going on. Horrible outrages, possibly terrorist bombings. Because outrages usually means bomb bombs at this time. And arson. Yeah. But they, they, they don't commit high treason. It's only attempted. We can take that one too. And the next one, genitalia. Well, I would say yes, because when the shape-shifting villain appears at the door, they are wearing a pink bathing suit, which uh, the observers, Wingless and Iceland, uh, are shocked because it shows their manly parts. Yes, double bingo! Yes, that is two full lines. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Right. I know this is amazing. Um, now, I think maybe there's no abortion in it. I think there's no abortion as well. I did look really hard for abortion and <laughs> alas. Right. Um, orgies. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of low grade wantonness. You know, the hypocrisy, the deceit, the drunkenness. Yes. And in, in such company, in actual contact with low types, but slumming it with the lower classes is not an orgy. No, that's true. Yeah. I mean, the pseudo duchess is hanging around with a lot of young men at the same time, but that's as far as we can go. Um, sexual assault. Well, the I would say at the very end, there's a lot of... Yeah, so I would hesitate to consider Pseudo Mary's attempted seduction of wingless as anything other than a sexual assault because you can't consent when you're being controlled by a skilled and shape-shifting mesmerist. Yes, yes. A vampiric shape-shifting... Hermaphroditic. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so we can take that. Extramarital pregnancy. No, but that would make an excellent sequel. Demon Spawn, said the Marcus. <laughs> that would be excellent god it's a shame you didn't think of that <laughs> can't take that one uh masturbation i didn't detect any no regrettably not um sex toys sure the pink bathing suit <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's close yes I'm not, I think I'm being, I'm, I'm jesting. Um, I think I think went too far. <laughs> yeah, no, we can't, alas. Um, feminism. Yeah, so in a way, maybe. So we have Arlen saying, in, even in these times of equal opportunities for women, it's not every day that a duchess is suspected of the crime of murder. So equal opportunities for women to be murderers. Although 
It's not the fact that she's a female criminal, allegedly, but an aristocrat aristocratic one that bothers him so is that really feminism yes but i suppose he does mention it like and, yeah and and later the, the sort of hierarchy of um the lower classes being equal or more equal there's that observation mm -hmm. that amongst the rioters there were as many women as men so equal opportunity rioting yes but but it's, it's a yes and no thing during the riot, the women had to contend themselves with lesser outrages, like throwing stuff outside of windows. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. so there's discrimination there. They weren't even allowed to completely destroy rooms and set things on fire. <sighs> but I, yeah, hmm. This is a difficult one. I think it could be a yes. Okay. Um, because he, he does say equal opportunities. And I think that's a, you know, language that only comes from one place. So that's good enough. Yeah. Uh, divorce. I did not detect divorce. No, I don't think anyone was mentioned as divorced. I mean, Mary, the aristocratic heroine, is an extremely virtuous member of the aristocracy as opposed to a loose divorcee. She's, she's widowed. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I don't think we can take that. Also, contraception. I have to say I didn't. No? Was I wrong? There's a reference. Is a reference enough? Yeah, could be. Um, so the police uh, want to basically ring up the doctor and ask his views on birth control to see what sort of man he is. Oh, yes. It's yeah, just yeah. a throwaway line, but if they're mentioning it openly. Yes, and using it as a litmus test of someone in some significant way. Yeah, I think that counts. We can take that one. And then menstruation. No. Nary nar nar a period. No, definitely not. Um, Blasphemy. Ooh, I mean, I, I'm curious what you think about this in particular. Yeah, I would say that the villain being called the Antichrist is interesting. Now, it's only very, very quickly, but it, it's in an, it's it's around the maybe it's after the interchange in which Mrs. Nottingale retorts to wingless even god himself couldn't really arrest satan so what could we expect a poor policeman to do and she calls on the, her biblical knowledge to uh to assert this so i think that's pretty blasphemous yeah i would think that it is blasphemous in the sense that if you could say satan or the antichrist is defeated or quelled at the end it is not through uh, prayers or clergymen or any of those religious things. It is through the the grit and the uh, hard work of policemen who are definitely not supposed to be quelling the Antichrist. So, yeah, I think that counts as blasphemous. And then oral sex. I did not, did not detect any. Yeah, I would agree there. I don't think so. Graphic violence absolutely yeah i mean at the end <laughs> wow <laughs> there's a lot of blood as well and tearing of flesh the description of the victim's injuries and the criminal's methods should be enough and arlen doesn't like leaving these things to our imagination he'll suggest that he will because somebody in the room has sort of you know um qualities that mean we should protect them in some way but then he'll eventually be explicit yeah, he's such a tease, isn't he, really? And it, it introduces the question of who Arlen's writing for. Might it be someone like Mrs. Nottingale, who's described as frequenting the theatres and cinemas where she enjoyed, rec uh, respectively, the lighter comedies and the most violent dramas? <laughs> and perhaps in this novel, they are one and the same. Yeah, there is that push and pull, isn't there, where he's like, he leaves it to your imagination for a while and he allows you to build it up, and then he shows you. And then you laugh at it. Yeah, you don't take it quite as seriously as you would have had you read it openly at the beginning. It's an interesting technique. And then finally, LGBTQ plus content. Well, I mean, there is so many ways to read this in terms of queer narratives and gender bending and fluidity, and it's huge. Yeah, so whilst I think the mistaking of Axlow for a sapphist rather than a sadist is humorous in 
in situ, it um, really speaks to the novel's underlying queer panic. The vision of him in the pink swimming costume is simultaneously meant to make us laugh, but also to horrify us. Mm. Um, so if, if, if there's not an affirmative queerness to it, there is certainly um, a questioning, curious, horrendous queerness. I mean, reading it as we are in the midst of a trans panic, I was kind of like, okay, <laughs> I don't know, this feels kind of disturbingly too, um, you know, too current, really. Yeah, it, it definitely speaks to the present moment, as does Richard Marsh's The Beetle, which would make a good pairing piece to read them together, just, just to see how uncomfortable particularly British people are made to feel by people who are not so easy to identify what their status is, what their gender is, what their race or ethnicity is, what their politics are. So should we count it up and see what we get? Actually, if we count up the ones that we didn't take, it might be easier because... I've got 17. Do you also have 17? Oh my God, 17? Is this one of the highest? Surely not. It's not, it's close. I mean, for a, for a novel from 1934, it's nearly unprecedented. This is a 1960 score. Okay, because I, it, surely Ulysses gets. Of course, but it wasn't technically banned. <laughs> No, no, of course not. I know the technicalities. <laughs> Ulysses gets a full house, of course. <laughs> and probably we would need to add things to fully encompass Ulysses's full range. <laughs> it's true. I'm still pushing for an incest square. I know. I, I can't believe I didn't put that in. <laughs> what, would you, what would you take away if you had to remove one? I think I would have to take away bestiality because it is so infrequent. It's just not something people reach for. Um, but incest, yeah, you'd be surprised. <laughs> mm, yeah. There's, yeah. Well, there's the incest narrative here as well. Yes, there is. Yeah. With the cousin. Because Wingless and the Duchess are cousins and he thinks of her like a sister. Until he doesn't think of her like a sister. No, then he's desperately reaffirming that she is like a sister. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, my God. That was amazing. 17 out of 25. And such an interesting read. I thoroughly enjoyed both reading it and talking to you about it. As as did I. Um, but I believe the pleasure is it's actually, since we, ne we now must sort of frame it and say this terms, was the pain. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you also. I'm so pleased I got to end a season on such a high note. What an exceptional score in censorship bingo hell said the Duchess achieved. Now keep subscribing because in season 10, I will be dissecting films for scandalous content. And I'm lucky enough to have a co-host, Dr. Lloyd Maeve Houston, who you might recognise from their appearances on here. Of course, there will still be censorship bingo, but we've come up with a creative twist on it. Find us on all the usual social media platforms to see exactly how creative we can be with naughty lists. I mean, we have photographs to prove it. Till then, keep your hands clean and your minds positively rotten with smut. 